Um, welcome today, everyone. It's great to be back together in our continuing effort to build community. Um, uh, thank you, Luisa, for your uh, introduction, and thank you to our hosts for uh, allowing us to get back together. Um, particularly thank you to each of you who are joining us today. Uh, we don't take lightly the commitment of time uh, that's involved and limited resources people have. So uh, thank you very much. We're humbled by your participation. Um, I think we've got a great topic in our continuing series on hot talks in mediation today. Uh, our dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Helen Winter, uh, is going to be talking about uh, a number of topics uh, around the issue of bias generally. And we think you're going to find that uh, fascinating, as I have uh, in my brief conversations with uh, uh, Dr. Winter. Um, welcome. Uh, okay, to call you Helen for today's uh, program. Just, uh, it feels awkward calling you uh, Dr. Winter, notwithstanding yeah, your newfound title. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bruce. I'm very delighted to be here. Um, hi, everybody. I'm um, excited to get to know you better and to have a conversation with all of you um, on today's topic. And yeah, you can all call me Helen. That's absolutely Thank you so fine. Much. I only just last week defended my my PhD. So I'm going to I'm going to <laughs> highlight that you were, uh, definitely do uh, the the uh, respect and congratulations um, that went into years of work. But let me start with a brief introduction of our friend Helen. Uh, she's an assistant professor uh, of law and practice at the Pepperdine Caruso uh, School of Law at Pepperdine University. The Strauss Institute of Dispute Resolution is parentally recognized as one of the leading institutions uh, in dispute resolution in the United States. Uh, I've had the privilege of teaching there myself for over 25 years, and they often correct me when I say one of the leading institutions, because more often than not, they are the leading institution. So um, uh, Helen holds a law degree, uh, like many of us. Hers is from um, uh, Heidelberg University. She also has an LLM in dispute resolution from Pepperdine University. And most recently, she just defended her PhD thesis in Berlin, and we're going to be talking about that. So congratulations on our newly minted uh, PhD, Dr. Helen Winter. Thank you uh, for joining us again today. Thank you so much. Bruce. I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm, I think the best uh, way to start is, as we have been trying to do in this program uh, throughout is bring our conversation to a level of relevance in Ukrainian mediators' lives with an eye toward how can we best add value to their challenging circumstances and ultimately prepare them to assist friends and neighbors and countrymen in uh, the days ahead. And so uh, first I thought I'd talk a little bit about your background with Resolute and some of the work you did in preparation for your PhD. Uh, can you start by just sharing with our audience kind of what Resolute is and a little bit of your background with Resolute? I think that'd be a good place to start this morning. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, back in 2016, I was doing my LLM here at Pepperdine. And um, during that time, as you all know, a lot of refugees came to Germany, I think 1.2 million back then. And I was feeling very far away from home. And I was thinking, you know, how can I help with the tools that I've learned that many of you have learned of mediation? What can I do? And so I was writing all my papers, research papers about this topic of peer mediation and bringing peer mediation to refugee communities, to refugee shelters. And then I was doing an externship at the United Nations after my LLM. And I was talking to a colleague there and, um, you know, I was talking about this idea of doing peer mediation um, in refugee communities, because also, you know, from my family back generations back, um, I had a, a refugee background and I can relate to that. Uh, of course, I've never experienced it, but I cared very much about this experience. And I talked to the colleague and he said, you know, Helen, that all sounds so fascinating. Why don't you just do it? Why don't you just set up an organization? I said, oh, I have no idea how to set up an organization. I have, you know, I have no background in business, nothing like that. And he said, well, that's great because I have a background in business. Why don't we do it together? And so that's how it kind of started. But I was in the US back then. So then when I went back to Berlin, we went into local language cafes where refugees were learning German, and we were asking them, hey, is this something you want to learn? Is, is mediation a topic that you would be interested in? And a lot of people said yes, 
We have so much conflict on a daily basis. We would love to learn it. And so the, the team grew. We had many of them join us and, and we founded an organization together. So it all started with this organization that's now trained, I think, more than 2,000 uh, participants as peer mediators in their communities. And then later, um, I got interested in doing a PhD about it as well. Fabulous. Let me ask you a couple of questions about that experience. Where were the refugees from that were then in Germany? So back then, a lot of them were from Syria and from Afghanistan. And the problem is that um, they stay into refugee in refugee camps up to six years um, on average in Germany. So it's it's really a long term accommodation, and it is something that's not a solution forever. And ideally, of course, they move out. They have their own apartment. They have a job. They can start rebuilding their lives. And in my research, I've seen that peer mediation can actually foster agency. And those who did the program with us were the ones that got an apartment, got a job, moved out, and then came back to the refugee shelter and volunteered there as mediators to solve conflict. And so it's really about the self-empowerment rather than coming from outside and, 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 and doing something as an outside mediator. It's giving the tools to the people who know about the conflict best. So that was the idea. And that's, that's what we've seen also in the research. And what did you and your colleagues teach them in the under the heading of peer mediation to that would enable them to yeah. sort of both live productively in refugee camps and ultimately succeed when they moved into broader society? So we've, we've basically um, started with story sharing. So it was about getting to know each other first and, and understanding what type of conflicts they are facing, what they're curious about, what they want to learn, um, you know, what the reality was like. And then arriving in Germany, coming from many different countries, um, you know, a lot of mi uh, cultural misunderstandings are happening. There's a cramped space in those um, facilities and, and the lack of perspective, really, because uh, a lot of people are not allowed to work. A lot of people are not allowed to, um, to, to do anything, really. And so the idea was to start with storytelling, to understand um, you know, where they are coming from, what they want to do. And we always had a co-trainer who um, also had experience to flee their home country, who was a trained mediator, because I always said, you know, I can give you some of the tools of mediation, but I have no idea what it's like to flee your home country. And my colleague, Mohammed, he knows what it's like. Um, he's also lived in a, in a shelter like this, and he now moved out, and he's now studying politics. And... Um, you know, is involved in, in, in resolute work. And so it's, it's that was, in, in the beginning, it was crucial to build trust, to be able to, to learn together, to create and cultivate, you know, a community of trust. And then uh, step two was to, um, to think about conflict resolution and to, uh, to build that competence. So thinking about what role does emotion play in conflict? What role does uh, culture play in conflict? And everything was very interactive. So the trainings are highly interactive. Um, based on conflicts that occur in those communities on a daily basis and, um, and, and role plays. And so step three is then um, training mediation skills. Um, and a lot of um, participants bring so much knowledge, you know, already to the room, you know, from their home countries. In Syria, for example, we have elder district resolution. So they bring that to the table. And um, I've often seen that they said, hey, we have this conflict going on. We don't want to do the role play. We rather want to, um, to play out a conflict that is actually happening here, which also, again, pertains to the idea that, yes, they are very much shaping the process, not just the mediation process, but also the training. And it's about them you know, regaining some of that agency that oftentimes gets lost, especially in the context of a refugee shelter. Because again, uh, a lot of time language is a, a huge problem. Uh, people need to learn uh, the language and they cannot just go to the doctor without a translator. So all of that kind of, um, well, minimizes agency just because, you know, you need help. All the time you need to ask, okay, can you help me fill out these forms? And so then seeing, okay, I can, I can help myself. I can be a mediator. I can actually help the people around me. I can make peace creates a lot of meaning for, for a lot of them. And they said, you know, um, I, I have regained part of that meaning and part of my identity because I was, for example, a lawyer in my home country, and now I'm working in construction in Germany. But because I'm a peer mediator, I'm now doing the things I've done with companies. I'm doing those things with residents. And I'm, 
you know, I am resolving conflict, I'm creating peace, I'm spreading charity. So those were all the, um, the I, I call them in vivo quotes that, uh, that, you know, I found in my, in my research as well, because I was doing interviews, I was conducting uh, uh, research and th this is what the people have told me and this is what they said you know what 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 it does and I think it's so important um, you know because it, there's nothing worse than 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 arriving somewhere and, and having to start from scratch and having you know to 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 build over and so creating peace gives a lot of meaning it's 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 not let, let me interrupt for one minute you're doing great your enthusiasm is palpable the work speaks for itself in terms of its value i'd like to slow you down just a little and ask some follow-up questions about yeah. the the logistics of how you do this always keeping in mind that our colleagues in ukraine hopefully will have the opportunity to replicate some of this kind of work in their own community so i want them to really understand how you go about this and let's uh, be fairly logistic in our conversation as well uh, mm -hmm. how how did you identify the people how large a groups uh, did you uh, pull together uh, how frequently would you meet with people you, you already spoke of the importance of having a local uh, facilitator someone who understands the culture and country from which these refugees come so give us a little bit of the sort of detail if you will that goes into someone who might want to replicate the good work that you've just described yeah so in the beginning you know we we started with flyers we went to the communities and we sat there and said hey do you want to come to our workshops and of course guess what it didn't work <laughs> Right, because we were just um, naive, and and you know we also went about this very academically, and and we were just not familiar at all with the context, with the culture. And then once we understood that trust is the real element, you have to know um, that you you have to be trusted. You have to show up every day, again and again and again, for people to to recognize you. And so you need you need an, a point of entry. So you need partners. For example, an organization. Um, that is already involved and does neighbor work or organizes neighbor e events with neighbors, you know, sports events, cooking events, things like that. Or you need to, especially when you when you do a program like this in a refugee shelter, um, the the oftentimes the management and the social workers already um, have gained trust by the uh, residents, and so you need them to kind of help you. Um, yeah, talk to to everybody and and advertise the training and say, hey, this is something um, we we really want to encourage you to do. And then you need to look for those that who are already peacemakers, who are already those that step up, um, you know, just naturally. And when they join, others join and they talk to their friends. And when the training is fun, then you're lucky and you have more people join you. But um, that that's really in the beginning, it was really tough. How, did you, how, how large groups did you set out to try and train? Um, so usually our groups were not more than 30 people. So one group was about 30 people. And uh, in the beginning, we spread it out over the course of many weeks. And then we understood, no, people want to see results. We rather have an intensive training that is uh, two weeks, but then, you know, days and, and evenings. And it was also very important for everybody to know that he, at the end he would get a certificate. And with that certificate, of course, that it's known that, you know, you could um, go to the job center and show it and prove, okay, you, you've gained communication skills, you've gained mediation skills. And that was very valuable um, for the participants and kind of spurred their also motivation to come to these trainings, right? Um, so thinking about even just these little logistics, right? And then and thinking about, okay, where do we do it? Do we do it in our place, our organization, or do we come to them? And the, the answer was no, we come to them because for them, sometimes it's difficult to even understand how to take the train and how to get there and uh, to motivate yourself to leave, um, you know? And, and of course, um, a lot of people are dealing with mental health uh, problems. And then again, we, we try to involve locals as well in our trainings. And we try to invite um, people, uh, Germans, uh, who wanted to join and who wanted to talk together and, and, and understand the other side and, and so on. Because of course, there was also a lot of prejudice going on, a lot of anxiety. And so the idea to bring Germans also to the refugee shelter was great because they could see, hey, I don't have to be afraid. I can enter this this world and everything is fine. 
and 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 that would already kind of help with tackling some of the prejudice uh, that we see. So so these logistics, I mean, it sounds simple now, but it it had to be worked out, and you had to try and error and, and understand, okay, what works, what doesn't work. It was always a surprise, actually. Yeah. Did you did you get to a point where you had a standard curriculum or set of lessons yes. that uh, you used in these programs? Yes, we got to the point where we had a standard curriculum. And we did work with our um, colleagues who, who also had to flee their home country, who were newcomers, and, um, and they helped us a lot. Um, and they shaped the program because they knew, okay, what types of conflicts are actually happening. And, and based on that, we wrote uh, the role plays, the exercises. So in the end, we did have a, a, a program or, you know, that is kind of, okay, from, from this time to that time, so very structured in a way, but allows for flexibility. And that was always the key, allow for flexibility, allow for surprises. I mean, sometimes we had groups that were so mixed, we had five different language groups. So how do we do, deal with all these languages? And then we understood, okay, that's too much. We can maximum have two different language groups, but then working with two fit co-facilitators who are uh, co-culturally facilitating, and but also, you know, interpreting if needed. Of course, the, the, the requirement was that you have a basic understanding of German um, to, to start the class. And however, we did have participants, um, you know, who, who joined and then their friends would help them understand. And of course, for the role plays, it makes sense for them to, um, to do them in their own mother tongue. Um, it makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, also later, the mediations they are conducting they are, of course, um, in their mother tongue. But we did have an interesting phenomenon. We had um, cross-cultural co-mediations going on when we set up the, the mediation clinic. And when there was a conflict, for example, between an Afghan and a Syrian family, and so the co-mediators would reflect the party's uh, cultural backgrounds, and that would kind of you know, get their buy-in and, and their trust in the mediation process, and that it's neutral. We did, of course, have a lot of... Um, questions around the topic neutrality, right? I mean, peer mediation, that's always the challenge. How can I be neutral? If I have friends in my community, if I have, um, uh, you know, if, if I am um, the neighbor, right? And, and but in the end, it, it worked out when we promoted the training. I mean, they had to do it. They, the peer mediator did is they promoted the training at the, for example, at a local summer festival. And the residents slowly understood, okay, if I have a conflict, I don't need to necessarily go to the management or to the social workers. I can go to the peer mediators. And we saw an amazing shift in power dynamics as well, because we had, uh, we had participants saying, you know, in this country, we are powerless. Here, for example, um, the, the shelter's management has the power. And later we had them say, you know what, they come to us now and we solve it in five minutes. And that was a conflict that the shelter's management couldn't solve in, in days, you know. And, and so, and the shelter's management also said, hey, we need the peer mediators. And then, as to your point, you know, uh, in terms of structure and time, um, we did have mentoring after the program set up. Um, and we checked in with them monthly for about six months to understand, okay, what kind of cases are going on to facilitate conversation between uh, the peer mediators and the shelters management and the social workers, because then, of course, you had these new structures. So then we mediated how they were going to do it and how they were going to set up these new mechanisms. And that was a whole other mediation <laughs> going on. But, but, but yeah, it, it was, um, you know, th there was no... Um, how do you say that? No magic, magic pill you can take, and then you know how this all works. You have to really try it out, and then see what works and what doesn't work. And uh, we did, of course, um, run into some some problems sometimes when uh, the shelters management said, "Hey, we, you know, it, it, when it's about house rules, of course that's different, right? We, there's not a lot of flexibility." So we also talked about, okay, which cases are uh, for peer mediation, which cases are not for peer mediation. You know, and um, and then there was a time in the beginning when the peer mediators started, and the management said, "Hey, you know, you're there. You can you can try the little little conflicts among children." And they were like, "No, we want to do the real thing." And they really could, was. and they could. And so it was about building trust. You know, building trust and and setting up a new a new system, dispute resolution system. Yeah. Let me go back for a moment. You said some uh, a number of things I want to touch on. 
Um, how long was the program itself once you uh, identified a group and began the, with the 30 or so individuals uh, through your curriculum? How long did it take to, to get through to completion? So it was five total days in total, but we spread it out over the course of um, two weeks. Mm -hmm. And we always say, you know, you are you will be a peer mediator. And when you practice, you will learn more. And during the mentoring and follow up workshops, you will learn more. However, you know, we, we cannot compare it to a mediation training where you're like, OK, now I'm becoming a professional mediate. And that was not the goal. The goal was, um, it, you can think about it because peer mediation, you know, the history of peer mediation is something that comes from, from schools and even the prison context. We have uh, in California, there's the, this project Prison of Peace, I think. Um, and and, and, and uh, people are trained in peer mediation. And the idea is that the, group, the peer group learns how to resolve conflict among themselves. And because they know about the peers, they know what, they, what their needs are. And so this is the idea of peer mediation. Um, and and um, the trainers, of course, they were professional mediators and they had a, a background in mediation. Would you be willing to make available in even the most general terms uh, for our audience what that curriculum looked like if people were eager to sort of move in that direction at some point in the future? It might be nice for them to have some kind of a starting point. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank you so um, much. And you, you may also, I may also, um, you know, if you uh, want to share my contact details, I'm happy to to provide everybody with more information. Um, I know that, you know, it um, it really takes a lot of stamina to do, to do this type of work. And I'm uh, very um, supportive of it because I think it can really have a huge impact. And it is... Um, it is it is great if people want to start something like this. Um, and so if you guys, if, if one of you says, okay, I want to try this myself, I'm really, really happy to, to share the resources we have, to share the knowledge uh, we have. We've done now online programs because um, of COVID, we had to kind of rethink our, our um, ideas. And so um, we've done, you know, just programs that are aimed at, at yeah, sharing and um, and supporting each other so it was more like a, a storytelling i would say um where people it was in this case it was afghan refugees they were all over the world and they joined over the course of six months so it was a longer program and they talked about their needs their challenges they were facing to each other and they had like a little bit of a, a group of friends who you know supported them throughout and um and motivated them and so this was this was another program we did we were now thinking about negotiation programs that we've started so it, it changed a little bit over time because of COVID and again um, it's at the same time it, it was ama more amazing to do this in person if you get the chance to do it I would I would recommend that it's it's different um, <clears throat> but there are many things you can do thank you Thank you for that generous offering, and we will surely make available your contact information because I can only imagine uh, the interest in something like this, given what our friends are going through at the moment. Can you give us an example, Helen, of a, uh, you've talked several times about the word trust and the importance of sort of building trust uh, in these um, um, uh, training moments. Can you give us an example? You've talked about storytelling. Can you give us an example of another technique or strategy that you use to try and uh, uh, build trust with people as you uh, seek to train them in peer mediation? Um, yeah, I think it's it's very important to be authentic and to always disclose what you don't know and um, and to always admit when you've made mistakes. And I think, you know, it's not just showing up every day because a lot of them are frustrated and they say, hey, we've seen so many projects come and go, but really nothing changes. It's really about, you know, following up and, and seeing and being there for them. That's one. And then also not being afraid of yourself being vulnerable. So, you know, share your own story, share your own hardship. And, and that can really uh, create trust because then you're opening up about what you what your story is, they will open up about their story and at the same time know where, you know, 
you can't compare it. So yes, empathy, empathy, of course, and we always talk about this in mediation, right? Um, and, and and of course, empathy also means to acknowledge your shortcomings and things you don't know. And so I think having this um, maybe attitude that shows some um, just kind of humility and, and respect for the unknown is really important. Um, and and what I find interesting also when you cultivate trust is um, when, when one person finally opens up and tells their story, it's very powerful to see um, how everybody around that person is listening and, and relates and can relate. And we had one person share, for example, how he was discriminated against um, at the job center and um, the the person working there called him, uh, I don't know, a donkey or something like that. And, and uh, he was just in shock because he was new. He wanted to understand how can he apply for a job in Germany. And he told that story to everybody. And, you know, you could really see that for the first time, it was such a relief um, for him to, to be able to share this and to be able to not be judged for that, but rather receive empathy, receive understanding, and and um, you know, and, and be in a community of of people who understood and who had similar situations. And and you know, we invite people to then talk about these situations. So okay, you know what what's going on? You are sitting on the bus. Somebody sits away from you on the bus. Why is that? So how can we you know think about some of these prejudices that are going on and. Um, and we we did invite Germans, and then they got to ask each other this difficult with these difficult questions and go through some of these situations together, and that kind of creates trust. What we also used um, as a technique was artwork. So in these story sharings, we uh, we asked people to draw to draw um, about a childhood experience, for example. That would be the first um, the first um, task, and then the second task would be. Um, to to draw a picture um, about um, a good experience in their life or a bad experience in their life so they can really choose. We don't want to say, hey, draw about, um, you know, the, the, how, how you fled your home. No, what you find though is many people will. And that kind of serves then, you know, when, when they show their pictures and we are in little groups, we discuss their pictures, it serves them to open up and to talk about their drawing and to say, hey, I drew this and this represents, you know, um, resilience for me. And, you know, and, and sometimes you see, we, we also, I mean, we have lots of mothers in our trainings with children um, and we, and of course, uh, you know, they are running around and sometimes they are also drawing and participating. And we had a child, you know, uh, draw um, when Germany won, <laughs> Uh, in in soccer and draw a draw like that he he was happy about that and things like that and it's it's really um, different what what people share but it is it's nice to um, to use art as a form of communication because it makes it less um, you know it's so hard to to talk about some of these uh, these these terrible things that happened and it makes it a little bit more human and people are less afraid to open up and it's also you don't have to you know if you don't want to draw you don't have to draw you can draw anything if you don't want to draw this you can draw something else so it's it's really um showing everybody that it's optional it's important to these trainings were not mandatory it was optional and um and once they have once people have fun they will come back and so we had actually come more people join than than leave which was nice. And then, of course, you know, you can do the training and be a peer mediator. You can do the training and not be a peer mediator. You don't have to be a peer mediator. Interestingly, everybody wanted to be a peer mediator afterwards. And it's, it's, that's important. How yeah. many people successfully completed your program? I think you mentioned this earlier, Helen. Yeah, I think it was about 2,000 people. 2,000. Fabulous. In Berlin, in Brandenburg, in Lower Saxony. So we were all around that area. We tried it in the Netherlands as well for a little while. Um, so it is. It was. It really requires though teams on the ground, and so the idea of of doing this would be to have people. You know, if you're thinking about doing something similar um, on the ground, to do it uh, with you, um, because it it is about trust. I mean, I feel like this is the most important thing to to have to establish this type of relationship. 
and mm -hmm. for people to know, hey, we're trying to do a good thing here and to not force it. I mean, they're, they're sheltered. Every, every shelter is different, right? Every community is different. And it didn't work. And, 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 the, and for example, the management didn't believe in mediation. They didn't know what mediation was. And you have to always kind of talk to different audiences because you need, of course, um, some sort of support, some sort of funding when, you, when you're doing workshops like this. You have to talk to politicians, for example. There will be politicians who believe in mediation, who love the idea and who know what it is. And then there will be others who ask you meditation. What, what do you mean? And, and, you know, because in Germany, again, uh, you know, the US, we, we are very advanced in mediation. Um, in Germany, we are very um, in the early state. I mean, we are advanced in family mediation, things like that. And it's growing. It is definitely uh, it's it's grown so much, but still there are some people who don't know what mediation is, less so now. However, you do have them. And then you want to really understand, okay, do I spend my time convincing this person now or is this not my time? Because, you know, you have to see, is there a chance or not? And and you have to find those people who believe in the idea of mediation. Um, I had a great chance to present with my colleagues um, at the, um, at one of the, the, well, it's it's Berlin's kind of um, organization for refugee mm -hmm. affairs, and it's an official organization. And I presented this program there. And interestingly, after you know many many times, they understood. Okay, it's so it's so crucial that they changed one of the policies. And now, in one of the policies, it says that um, you know shelters manage management and carriers of shelters or organizations of, of refugee shelters are encouraged to implement peer mediation mechanisms. So it's an incentive, which is now in a policy, which is great. So you can see that with your little grassroots efforts, you can actually change um, a system more long-term and you can, you can influence policies. It, it's incremental steps, it's tiny baby steps. But now in Berlin, we have this, this policy, which is really, really nice. And it's a direct outcome of Resolute's work. And that is, um, it's taken a long time for them you know usually if you think about funding as well maybe that's also interesting perhaps for a lot of people here um it, you 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 see that of course the government will give funding to those organizations that are known for example the red cross or what or, or other organizations then they don't know resolute so then you have to just show them hey i'm we're still doing it we're still doing it we're still doing it and then year three, they, then maybe the Deutsche Bank, which is a German bank, will donate or the, the train, right, German train, something like that. And then we're still doing it. And then eventually we, we got a, a good grant by the German government, but it took a long time. And um, because your trainers, the trainers you're going to be having, your team, they want to, of course, see something for their training because this is hard work if you're doing this, especially in cross-culturally facilitating you know, dealing with, with a lot of stories, with a lot of trauma um, and, and yourself having that burden to carry as well. So so that's hard work. And so obviously you want to um, reward those trainers that you have uh, with, with something. And so thinking about funding, thinking about crowdfunding becomes really important when you do this work, even though you are a charitable organization, you're not here to make for profit. But this was the other aspect of it. So, you know, um, it was interesting because my role was sort of first of all a trainer, then an entrepreneur, then a researcher. So it always shifted depending on where the needs were. You know, you wore a lot of different hats, really. Yeah, yeah. Helen, so that's what you will be doing. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. You're obviously tremendously empathetic. You've talked a lot about stories. They're so important in conflict resolution, and you you teased us a little bit at the beginning of today's conversation by suggesting your own family may have some background in a refugee moment. Would, would you be willing to sort of share that with the audience so they get to know you a little better? Oh, sure. So this was actually the family of my my grandfather who was in Eastern Europe and they lost um, everything and the, their, his mother and his sister uh, were also um, raped at the cause of that. And so um, you know, I don't really know what it's like, but it is something that, of course, he talked about and um, and which just, yeah, just resonated with me. And I just thought, you know, I can I can at least do a little bit uh, in that context and, and help a little bit. 
Thank you. You're doing more than a little bit. You're doing quite a lot. (laughs) Congratulations. Your story is inspirational. I I would like to move on. Uh, Time goes so quickly in these conversations. I could spend the rest of our time asking you more questions because I'm fascinated with Resolute and your work there. Uh, But I also know that a particular area of expertise for you has to do uh, with um, bias and studying Mm -hmm. a bias. And your work at um, uh, the Harvard program on negotiation, and I've read with interest before we even met uh, the wonderful Law Review article that you wrote uh, with David Hoffman, another dear friend of ours. uh, uh, I'll read the title, Follow the Science, Proven Strategies for Reducing Unconscious Bias. And I'd like to talk a bit uh, in the time we have remaining about unconscious bias and the lessons that it portends for uh, our audience in their work uh, that lies ahead. Um, I'm, I'll am i admit to um, a frustration I've had for 30 years in this industry, which is the use of the word neutrals and neutrality, you know, in our business uh, as almost a shorthand for, you know, our profession. And it's bothered me long before I understood any science around this topic. But uh, I there was a quote years ago that I read that was, there is no neutrality. There is only greater or lesser awareness of our own bias. And that, I think that's a good lead in uh, to the work that you've done. Would you start, if you would, uh, Helen, by just describing um, what you were doing in contemplation of uh, writing this research paper, uh, and we'll make this paper available to to people as well in our audience. But describe a little bit of the work that went into this, what your goals and objectives were, and then I want to ask you some questions about that work. Okay, sure. Yes. So um, I thought it was really interesting to research bias and to understand, you know, what what unconscious bias actually means and if we can do something about it, if there are some strategies out there um, that can help to to reduce bias. And so David was always interested in that, you know, he's also uh, researching diversity in mediation. He's teaching a class at Harvard on diversity in mediation. And so he said, you know, um, why don't we just look at all the social psychology literature that's out there, and it's quite a lot, um, and see what the status quo is and try to understand it for lay people, like people like you and I, lawyers, or, you know, from many different professions who have no idea uh, about social psychology. And so the challenge was to review all these social psychology articles and yeah. meta-analyses and to kind of um, translate it, let's say, to, for for lay people and for lawyers. And and that was the idea because um, we always thought, you know, as mediators, and I don't think we, we can ever be neutral exactly, uh, we have this obligation to be, uh, let's say, uh, multi-partial. We have this obligation to be unbiased. However, we can ne- never be unbiased because bias is something that that everybody has. Everybody has biases. Everybody has unconscious bias. And so... When we looked at the literature, we, we found that there are seven strategies that actually work um, to reduce bias. However, only if you use them over a long period of time repetitively. So again and again and again, multiple of these strategies. If you do, for example, an anti-bias training for two hours, you might show, because there is a test, a test that can measure bias that's called the implicit association test, you might show better results on that test. But then if we do the test again, a couple of months later, nothing has changed. So the idea was, can we actually do something? Um, Can we de-bias? I mean, I think we can never, never um, completely um, de-bias human beings. However, we can make a a difference. And so the first strategy, for example, is simply just raising awareness on on unconscious bias and becoming aware of your own biases. Can I interrupt, Helen, one second? I do want to get into those uh, yes. techniques one moment, but I, want, I don't want to leave anybody behind. It's an important conversation to have. Uh, recognizing we have a fairly sophisticated audience, can you just take a moment and describe the difference between conscious and unconscious or implicit bias to make oh, sure yeah. we're all using the same language? And then yes. uh, I'll ask a follow-up question. Right. So unconscious bias is something that we are not aware of. It consists of um, attitudes and, and, and attitudes are unconscious and those are feelings right 
as opposed to explicit bias, which is something we are aware of, we know that we have this bias. And unconscious bias is something we cannot know about, but we can make it visible. We can make it visible, for example, even in MRI scans. So you would see, for example, um, a fight or flight response on this on an MRI image. You can see that because the amygdala hi is hijacked. So um, you, you will see that fight or flight response. And so we know that unconscious bias can be made visible just because people are being shown, for example, for a split second, a picture of somebody who looks different from them. And they have this fear response. And, they, and later they don't recall seeing the picture. They don't recall that they ever saw a picture. So we know that, that unconscious bias exists and that it's just feelings, implicit feelings, attitudes, and um, as opposed to explicit bias, where we are aware of, of that we have bias and stereotypes towards people and we know, oh, you know, we, we become aware. But we can become aware of our unconscious bias. And one way of doing that is simply by, by for example, um, taking the implicit association test. I think we can later maybe send send the link to the test as well. Um, and, and, and it is great because you will you, you can get you can take the test on so many different topics, for example, on gender, on um, disability, uh, sexuality. There's so many topics you can take the test on. And then uh, sometimes you will be surprised because you think, oh, I will be I will have not any biases and you will find you actually do. Or you think hmm, that might be something I'm, I'm totally biased and you feel like, oh, I, I don't really. It's just a low score. So it's, it's, it, it's nice also to take it and then to discuss with a friend and to see, OK, what, where are my biases? Because then you become more aware. And once you are aware, you can set an intention, a motivation to tackle these bias, which is the second strategy. It's setting uh, an, an, a preferable internal motivation. So something, you know, that's intrinsic. Mm -hmm. It's it's not like you want to tackle bias and, and you put a bias training on your resume and then you look like, hey, <laughs> you know, that that's great. You want to actually foster your, your allegatarian goals. You want to do something about bias and then set that intrinsic motivation uh, to, to counteract that. Yeah. Sounds like you would agree with this statement that um, we can't eliminate unconscious bias. We can only seek to reduce its impact on our decisions and, and perceptions. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We cannot eliminate yeah. it. We can, uh, we, we can reduce it. We can reduce it for sure. So we can, we can see that if we do some of these techniques uh, and we, we can talk a little bit about what those are, um, if we do them over a long time, we can reduce our unconscious bias. However, um, I don't think we can ever eliminate it. I mean, it's, it's not possible, but we can make an effort. We can make an effort because as we know, um, the impacts of bias uh, are, are just um, terrible. I mean, it, it leads to even more polarization, marginalization of, um, of minorities. And uh, it has direct impact on decision making, um, right? I mean, for example, if we look at um, at healthcare, and we know that um, that women and people of color are being treated differently with the same disease, and if we ask the doctor, "Are you biased?" they would most li likely say no. However, there is unconscious bias, and so training people on unconscious bias can have positive impact on a societal level, but we really look at the individual level of bias and then we know it can, it can change, it can change uh, on a broader level as well. You've raised some important points I want to circle back to. One was a comment, which is if you ask people if they're biased, even though they may be displaying biased tendencies, they will say no. And mm -hmm. that speaks to the unconscious nature of what we're describing. I often say in my lectures, uh, one of my favorite quotes from a, a German philosopher is that uh, uh, the limits of my words are the limits of my world, and that the language we use defines, you know, how we sort of perceive things. Of course, 
And, and the idea that we use this word bias, which most of us associate with conscious bias and uh, the the um, and, and sort of unfortunate consequences of so much of that in our world, that when we get to the conversation of implicit bias, it does connote a, a sense of, of a bad mindset. Yet what you're describing, Helen, is that it is unconscious and therefore you know, we have to work to identify it in the first instance. And and um, again, your paper, uh, the Law Review article uh, at the very beginning, talks to the, a myriad of examples of how this plays out in our society. And you just commented on healthcare. I think it was last year that uh, Stanford Medical Center produced a study that talked about how different um, people were being treated in emergency rooms uh, during visits of different ethnic backgrounds. And it was fascinating. But your, your, um, why don't you share some other examples uh, from your um, law review article of different ways that it, implicit or unconscious bias manifests in our daily lives? Yes. So one example that I, that I really found fascinating is um, is the example of, of, of um, learning, learning with textbooks and seeing, for example, girls learning with a textbook that displays uh, female scientists perform better on an exam than girls who look at just men uh, and, and male scientists in these textbooks. So it is being represented in a textbook can have direct impact on how you perform and how, how good you are on a test, which is which was fascinating to me. Another very fascinating example uh, was that simply just um, thinking about someone who is different than you, who looks different than you in a positive way and imagining a positive interaction, simply imagining having a coffee chat with them, having a smile, a laugh with them can reduce your unconscious bias towards that entire group of people. So we call those um, outgroup members, people who look different, who are different from us. And that can already, simply imagining a positive interaction, it doesn't have to be a real life interaction, which is so interesting. It can be indirect contact, uh, can reduce unconscious bias. And, um, and that I found incredible. I mean, uh, just incredible. Another very interesting aspect is uh, meditation, meditation, meditating uh, regularly decreases unconscious bias. Um, mm. we, we become less judgmental as we train our brain to, um, to, to calm down. And, uh, and so meditation is something you can do and people who meditate show better results on the IIT, fascinatingly so. And in the MRI scans, because of course they're, they don't have such heightened fear responses. They, um, they are able to remain calm under stress. And so when they experience a threat, their pain threshold is, is let's say, um, low, uh, higher, is higher. Yes. So that's like fascinating as well. A, a, a deceleration is a word I use a lot in mediation, in mediation training and meditation helps us slow down, decelerate. And would you agree that... Um, the more we slow down and the more we become conscious of our uh, thoughts and decisions, uh, the less likely we are to be influenced uh, by unconscious bias? A hundred percent, yes. Yeah. Yes, the, re the research really shows that. And I, I want to uh, give a little bit of a disclaimer here in the context, we are in the very beginning of understanding all of this. Yeah. So, you know, this is the very early stage of understanding unconscious bias, of understanding the neuroscience of unconscious bias. I mean, we haven't even begun looking into that. It's fascinating. And there will be a lot of research in the years to come. I think in the next 10 years, we will see much more. Um, however, it's a start. It's a start to say, yes, there are strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, and for example, you know, um, becoming more conscious, as you said, and calmer really leads to um, to making better decisions, to being more reflective, more self-aware, and therefore um, the unconscious bias can decrease. Um, another interesting technique is simply um, getting to know people in a, in a more three-dimensional way. So seeing people as individuals rather than, uh, you know, uh, this group of people, um, you see them as an individual human being. You ask them about their hobbies, what they do in their free time, you know, how 
uh, their life choices were influenced. Um, and, and it changes everything. And that can be, for example, extremely important in a courtroom when you talk to a jury, because you can definitely um, paint a picture of an individual rather than uh, a suspect who um, has this background or that background. Uh, many years before I began to read about the social, social psychology behind bias, I um, had this idea that what we were trying to do as mediators to overcome the influence of uh, unconscious bias that is so pervasive in our minds, in our um, persona, uh, was that we really needed to remain curious. That we, what we really needed to do, to your point, Helen, a few minutes ago, was try and develop uh, a more complete picture of who this person was in front of us, who this person is. Uh, and, and I call them developing the data points. And I use several examples uh, when uh, I used to be in a position to sort through resumes, whether they were people seeking jobs in my old law firm decades ago or in the capacity of mediators. Uh, I, I always enjoyed looking at their personal hobbies and things that distinguish them as individuals and found it fascinating to take those up in conversation because it allowed me to really, uh, what I call the, sort of the antidote or, or kryptonite to unconscious bias was yeah. really that curiosity. What's your thoughts as you kind of listen to that uh, less than scientific uh, uh, example? Absolutely. I think curiosity and curiosity is one of the, the main um, characteristics of also being a good mediator and getting to know the other side and and um, just kind of having that open mindset to invite somebody in and to not judge them, but rather getting to know them for who they really and truly are as a human being and then treating them with, with that respect and dignity. I think that is crucial. And having that open mindset and this, this curiosity definitely helps as a mediator, but also for yourself to to uh, to tackle um, your your biases that you will have that you naturally have that's definitely true, hundred percent. I also think there's something very liberating for all of us to more to more deeply understand implicit bias and knowing that it's not an indictment of some uh, conscious misgiving or or uh, failure, you know, in who we are. It's it's yeah. part of an evolutionary. Uh, development of how our brains work basically to save energy and uh, we know that we couldn't possibly uh, bring to a conscious level for decision all of the inputs in our environment we'd be completely overwhelmed and paralyzed and so yeah. it's basically as you point out just starting with a better understanding of who we are how we work and think and and input uh, our environment and then in those instances where it jeopardizes our ability to make informed intelligent uh, impartial decisions to slow down and think about these things and be more conscious of it are there other techniques that uh, um, uh, you identified uh, in uh, your uh, research paper in the law review article, which we will make available and share with our audience, but other things that you think would be sort of practical for our audience to consider? Yes, I think, you know, just, just going out there and spending time with people who are different from you is, is a, one of the most powerful things you can do. For example, seeking out um, cultural experiences, a book club, things like that. And because we tend to sometimes have friends who all look like us, have the same age, same gender. Um, I sometimes do uh, an exercise in, in um, my trainings that is list five people who you trust. And they, they will take notes and write down the people who they, whom they trust. And then uh, write down their occupation, their gender, um, their age, um, and, um, and backgrounds and ethnicity. And so you will sometimes find a lot of people write down people who are similar than themselves um, and, and to venture out and seek opportunities to get to know people who are different can be a, a wonderful opportunity to um, just get to know people and, and understand who they truly are. So I think that is, that is one of the techniques, um, contact uh, with others that is really powerful. Um, you spoke to that as a great example in your refugee groups where you would bring German uh, citizens into those conversations and break down some of those divides that 
uh, unfortunately exist between in groups and out groups at the outset. Um, mm -hmm. If you had one or two takeaways from the research and writing and thinking that you did in preparation uh, of this fairly lengthy um, uh, article and recognizing that the science is new, as you point out both today and in your article, what sort of stands out for you in a deeper understanding of, of bias? Um, what really stood out for me is the idea that, first of all, um, it is incredibly persistent. Bias is in incredibly persistent, but it is malleable. So we can do something about it. And how can we do something about it only over a long period of time, again and again and again? And by simply reminding us, you know, journaling. Journaling is another amazing technique um, that we would that would fall under perspective taking and empathy. Um, that's not new to anybody here. We always try to take perspective and emphasize, uh, especially in the mediation. However, then journaling, for example, about the day of someone who's being discriminated against and how that made them feel. Um, studies have shown that, that this reduces bias. So we can, we can do little things. Uh, even just being grateful for the things we have and writing that down um, can help. So I feel like doing this over a long period of time, that was really key to me because often our industries push for, and it's now bias is this new uh, buzzword. So just speak and they push for, okay, let's do one training. Um, and other takeaways, is there this one training yet? Um, or, or what would that look like? And um, how can we um, actually make change that is long lasting and not just uh, a plaster on a wound? You know what I mean? So, so we have to really just raise awareness that yes, we can do something the way how we do it, that's yet to be understood by a lot of uh, people and it, it only works over long term. That's an important takeaway as well. I was um, interested in reading that uh, in the law uh, journal article that you wrote that a anti-bias training or bias awareness training, bias reduction training in whatever capacity it's offered is somewhat palliative and not persistent over time unless it, it's followed up. And that, that was an important takeaway for me in reading what you wrote. Go back to the com comment you made a minute ago, Helen, about journaling. I'm, I'm fascinated by that at a lot of levels. Uh, my background was in psychology and a good colleague of mine who's a psychotherapist talks about the importance of writing things down and self-reflection. Um, and it's, it seems like a, an interesting tool that many uh, members of our audience um, might find uh, value in taking the time to do some of that. Expand on that for just a moment. Sure. So I think what you can do is simply, um, if you watch a movie, for example, about somebody who has a completely different life than you and goes through struggles such as, for example, you know, uh, contract, contracting a, a disease that will lead to, for example, death. And they know um, that this will happen. And you can really emphasize with them by journaling about their experience. And this can reduce your unconscious bias um, towards people with deadly disease, for example. And, um, and you know, this is, this is what the science shows that you can do that. Um, but I feel like it would be a, a lot of efforts to, to do so. So I think what you can also do is just simply go around in your life and, and if you notice little interactions where you're like, oh, here I might have acted a little bit in a biased way or, you know, things like that happen. I mean, for example, I was in Germany and um, I was waiting in line and, and someone was in front of me and um, they looked like they weren't from Germany and I spoke in English. And then I was like, oh, my God. And, and they replied in German to me. And then I was like, oh, that is a bias that I had that I thought they don't know German. And so journaling about that creates awareness and uh, and and yeah and fosters your your understanding about who you are and who you want to become and um if you if you can do something about it yeah I'm fabulous um as you and i think of the best ways to try and help our audience moving forward uh, are there other lessons um that we can impart uh, to help raise consciousness about this topic or offer strategies that people can be thinking about, uh, as you've just described one, to implement in their daily lives or thinking even further ahead as they engage 
neighbors and colleagues in disputes going forward, how can they best prepare themselves for those moments so they can be effective and, and helpful? Um, one, one strategy that David has actually uses is put up images and pictures in his office of people who are different. Uh, of outgroup members and who are um, famous and successful and, and out there in the world. And he looks at them every day. So you can also put that on your screen, um, you know, as a screen saver, something like that. It's little tricks like that. And we, we call that stereotype negation um, as it negates a stereotype, uh, because usually we might associate uh, this, this type of person with something completely different. And so we see that every day. And so that can really change something. Um, which is a little trick. And then just moving forward, one thing you can do right now uh, is um, as, as scary as it sound, sounds, but you can take the implicit association test. Um, you just type that in. Um, it was uh, developed by Professor Banaji at Harvard um, and Professor Greenwald at Harvard. So they co-developed the test. You can type it into Google implicit association test. We can also send it to you, I believe. And then you can, it takes 10 minutes. You can take the tests on a topic you like and it will already alter your awareness and you can work uh, work on that. Um, that's that's something you can do right now. I always feel like it's nice to um, to also, you know, get, get some input and then follow up with it. Great. Uh, and we're clearly going to leave our audience today with some specific suggestions um, if there, and certainly I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but if there are articles to read or books to read on the topic that you might recommend uh, for those uh, who have the ability to uh, kind of read the, the Eng in the English language, we might make available that bibliography, uh, but the implicit association testing uh, I've done and I can't recommend highly enough. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, and and uh, particularly to uh, better understand our own bias on issues that we might not think we have. And uh, when I uh, took a bias reduction course at one point, um, it was, there was a conversation, and I won't remember the detail precisely, but our lecturer was uh, giving an example of showing pictures of young African-American males and a correlation with different words that came to mind. Yeah. And they, they were, for the most part, uh, negative words that uh, were associated uh, with these young African-American males. And what was fascinating several years later, as I think back on that training, was how many uh, African-American adults shared similar biases as Anglo-American adults in looking at those pictures. And so I think we all have uh, uh, benefit uh, and need really a better understanding our own biases on a variety of topics. So yeah, by all means, and these are, uh, and as you've pointed out, these are private tests you take, but there is some value in maybe sharing some of that with a trusted friend or colleague where you can reflect on those experiences and that shared learning uh, beyond yourself for those who are brave enough to do it. I've found that to be helpful as well. Absolutely. And I mean, the inventor herself, she was surprised when she took the test. So Professor Bernardi was like, oh, I, did, I don't think I would have any issues with this. And <laughs> she did. So, you know, and there's a great book also by her called Blind Spot, um, if you want to uh, read more about it. Um, I can also recommend a great um, TED talk called The Danger of a Single Story. Um, so you learn more about what narratives do in our lives and how narratives can shape the way we think to your point about language, Bruce. Yeah. And so there, there's a lot of resources I'm happy to share um, with all of you. And I'm, I'm glad to see some German in the chat. Thank you uh, <laughs> for that, um, Janina. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, let's do this. Let's pause for a moment. I do want to make sure we have time for questions uh, as we move through the, these important uh, topics of conversation and address what is um, of predominant interest to our audience. Um, so let me pause for a moment. I don't know uh, who's going to be um, sharing uh, questions that came up um, in the text versus a, a, a live question, but let's just you and I pause for a moment and see if there is anything that's been uh, coming through while we've been talking in the last hour or so. Uh, this is our dear uh, good Angelina. afternoon. Can you hear me? 
We can hear you, yes. Так. Я перепрошую перекладачі прикладати. So, in let's let me just start with the words of gratitude for support of this project. And I am really grateful to Bruce Edwards, Susan Edwards, uh, and the, of course, the speaker, Helen Winter. It's a unique opportunity. I watched your videos, your um, presentation speeches. It's just amazing. I'm sure the experience you're sharing with, with us is going to be uh, something we can learn from. I'm not sure if we will have a lot of questions, but I, uh, if I may, would ask one. Uh, what, uh, Helen, question to you. What mistakes uh, did you make? What would you recommend to avoid? Or maybe some ideas you had which proved to be uh, wrong or ineffective? Something not to do, to avoid doing? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think that's definitely the approach we we did was trying everything and then learning what not to do one thing what not to do um was definitely once we were advertising uh peer mediation trainings in one of the refugee shelters and somebody came and offered tea and said hey you want to sit down with us have some tea and i said well but the workshop is starting in five minutes i can't have tea with you now and i left and i said i'll be back later nobody showed up because I didn't, I didn't drink the tea that was offered to me. So knowing about the culture and what what it means, um, if somebody from Syria offers you tea, is really important. Um, and and at the same time, it can bring peace because in the same instance, one of the peer mediators, for example, um, uh, refused to drink the tea he was offered by. Uh, two families who had a fight and he just eventually said you know you're, we're getting nowhere here I'm your guest but I'm, I will not touch the tea anymore I will not eat your food anymore and the parties were faced with the social uh, fraud uh, you know of losing face and they were quickly finding solution because the, the mediator had to be their guests and 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 you know and so it can in learning about this and and um and knowing um, about different cultures and how everybody sees the, the world differently and not judging that and allowing these views in is important. So mistakes you can make is, um, you know, being assumptuous and, and instead of open-minded and curious, what we talked about earlier, right? Um, and one in one instance, um, we were done with the training, you know, everybody was already getting their certificates. And one of the peer mediators got up and said, you know, what I really think is, a mediator should be old and male and have a lot of life experience. And thankfully, you know, translation was a bit delayed. So I got, I could kind of like catch my temper in that <laughs> moment. But I, I was thinking like, okay, we had this great training, you know, all of our colleagues, they were back then in their late twenties. Um, it was crazy, but then I understood, okay, you know, we can't, we, is our intention to, cha to change this worldview or is our intention, intention to, to, um, to just accept that everybody has a different um, perspective? And interestingly, later, the very same person who, who said that he was, when he was advertising mediation at the summer festival, he said, you know, somebody asked him a question. He said, I don't know the answer to that. You have to have Helen. She's the boss. And then I was like, okay, you know, so maybe there was a little bit of a, of a shift and, and knowing that culture is different and, and, and inviting that in, but um, it, it, it can be, there, there's lots of mistakes we made, lots of mistakes. This is something um, you will have to anticipate. You will make, you will make mistakes. Thanks for the question. That was a great question. It's fascinating how much we learn from negative experiences, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, because I, I, I had a choice to get really angry and to say, hey, women rights and, you know, uh, and, and what about uh, learning and studying and all that with a German mindset? Um, <laughs> and then it's like, okay. <laughs> Fascinating. Let's see if there are other questions that have come from our audience. Uh, 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 Dmitro uh, raised his hand, but if I may, one more question from me. Helen, how, uh, what can we do to prepare well for such trainings? 
when we work with refugees, with displaced persons, what's the key issues we have to focus on while we are preparing for such training? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, that that would be that would be a really long answer. I think the the key ingredient is um, to know and to to honor the experience that people have had, and to to know that trauma exists, um, and to um, to invite in also um, you know just just stories that will be hard, and to not be afraid. Of addressing those um, and rather encouraging it, um, but only if you have already cultivated trust. So, so the main takeaway is you have to cultivate trust to do to do to do it to even just begin and to start, and that can take time. Um, but that's why I recommend starting with the storytelling and not with the training. Starting with an open discussion, open forum where you can address some of these things that people have on their mind. Um, and to allow allow for voices and to um, yeah to to expect I mean thank God er everything went well so far but I mean we we also we did work with so with psychologists I want to note that in, at this point uh, because we have um, built in um, let's say um, in our curriculum as mental health awareness training as well as we found that you know um, because fifty percent of the refugees are traumatized. Um, they and and trauma can be very stigmatized in some in some cultures, and they don't know that they can actually heal it. So we did work with psychologists who then um, raised awareness on the topic of mental health, and we had partner organizations um, who particularly treated trauma, who treat trauma. And so with that um, in mind, mental health is very very important, and knowing. It will come up and anticipating how you're dealing with it and that you need professionals. Um, even though our aspiration was not to cure trauma, it was to raise awareness and then have a plan as to, okay, what happens next? Somebody, you know, and then somebody will open up about, hey, I'm doing a therapy. It actually helps me a lot. And others will hear that and will say, hmm, but I thought everybody who's doing therapy is crazy. And then they will say no, you know, and, and this and this and allowing for these conversations that will be difficult and will come up. That's important and anticipating it. Thank you. OK, yeah. another question, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At the beginning of the uh, session, Edward said that uh, that uh, Helen Winter would be sharing with us uh, her experience and that we uh, could probably try it, uh, try using it in our situation in Ukraine. So, based on that, I have a uh, one follow-up question and one independent question so follow-up question you've had your experience with uh, refugee camps as much as i uh, as, as far as i understood it was in uh, germany yes uh, so you were working in uh, so-called private camps or closed type tam uh, camps where uh, refugees are not allowed to go outside without permission is it is it correct and the second question i have uh the attendees or participants of your trainings uh have you ever heard from them that they would like to go back to their home country or all of them would were preferring to stay in germany for the future Thank you for your question. So to your first question, um, it's like this. Uh, refugees arrive in Germany and they are placed in refugee shelters where they can stay up to six years uh, before they find their own place. But they are allowed to leave the shelter. Unfortunately, though, the shelters are sometimes placed in the far outskirts of the cities. So they're not right in the cities. They are kind of isolated. So even though they can do whatever they want, of course, they are not locked into the shelter. 
uh, that would be terrible, they are still isolated and they have not a lot of communication and interaction with locals. And so um, uh, we go to them because it's just difficult uh, sometimes for them to, to also take the train and come a long way. Um, but but yes, they, they can move. And that was one point of entry you can use. Um, you can also, of course, think about um, creating another structure, inviting people from the community. If there are no, nothing like a refugee shelter, you can still um, train people as peer mediators for their neighborhoods, I think. Um, or you can create a neighborhood center, something like that, in which you can offer these workshops. Of course, that will be really challenging and everything will be from scratch. Um, because there are no existing structures. So you will be the one creating these structures. And I think that is important to keep in mind that we already had existing structures we had to work with. And sometimes you will have to come up with structures. Um, to your uh, second uh, question, um, now please remind me what that was. <laughs> Bruce, do you remember? The people who were working uh, so people you worked did they want to go with, back to their uh, country oh, yeah. the refugees yeah, they, whether they were you. willing so, to go back to their home countries yes, uh, yes, of course. Uh, yes. would they have intention to go back uh, to uh, uh, their uh, uh, countries so, or they were thinking of uh, staying in germany for sure and uh, being integrated into the uh, host uh, hosting society so it was different um, for 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 them. Some of them um, knew they can never go back home, right? Um, for example, some of the Syrian refugees um, said, "Okay, you know, I really want to go home, but I cannot go home. Um, so I will try to to just build my life here now." Um, where some of the Afghan refugees uh, until today say, of course, I want to go home. I want to go home and I want to change it. And I don't, I cannot tolerate the regime. I cannot tolerate what's going on there. So it was very mixed. I think everybody is missing home. Everybody wants to go home and nobody voluntarily was there uh, and said, okay, I, lo I love being here now in Germany. Um, I think the intention was um, to, to, to deal with the situation as is and to hope to become more resilient and to hopefully eventually be able to to go home and to make a difference that was the sentiment that our participants shared with us thank you we may have time for one or two more questions if there are any I wonder if there is more questions. Uh, Helen, uh, uh, how many uh, people are uh, recommended to uh, be part uh, of training and how would these people uh, be selected? Uh, uh, did you check uh, their background uh, before engaging them uh, into, uh, into uh, training? Uh, so what was uh, the structure of, uh, uh, of, of the groups for training? Yes, that's a great question. So we had up to 30 participants and um, we had the shelters management help us to select uh, the participants. It was an open invitation to everybody. And um, the, the prerequisite was, however, to know a basic understanding of German. And um, other than that, we didn't have any prerequisite. We did ask then for a list of participants uh, to understand languages and to know what type of languages are going to be in the room. And then we could prepare and know, okay, who of the co-facilitators have to be there? Um, who are we going to work together with? However, um, it was important um, to work with the shelters management and to know someone who knows the participants already and who can help to assist us with that because we were basically new in this environment, in this context. And so we had to have someone who's familiar with it. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's you, you, you get a list, sometimes you don't get a list because sometimes people show up who you didn't invite. And of course you will still tolerate that they are there. You will welcome them. You are happy they are there. So um, it's an open invitation. I would make it as broad as possible. Be of course, not, not more than, than 30 because it has to be a good learning environment as well, but um, make it an open invitation 
and try to get as many people as possible interested in, in this training. Um, that is very important because then, then you will see who will follow up with it, who will show up again and again. But you have to be flexible and you have to know that when you say the training starts at four, the training will actually start at five. So, you know, just being a little bit more just uh, attuned to, to differences is, is the key and being flexible, open, curious. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, one last question I think we have time for. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Please, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Then building competencies and then training skills. Am I right? Yes. Okay. So then, uh, I'm curious if you can share a, a bit more details. How do you support these people after training? How do you su really support them to build these uh, skills which are needed? Yes. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so basically, it will it will start with so so they will get their certificate after the training. Then we will start setting up the peer mediation clinic. So we will have to try and talk about logistics. We have to understand how does that actually work. Um, will they get a room? Will they be called by the residents? Will they be referred by the social workers? What is it that they want? And they will set up a system. They will tell you what they want. And once they set up a system, they will advertise for the system. So they will use events like the summer festival to advertise how this is going to work. And then ideally they say, hey, we want our pictures at the front door entrance with our number. And we want to be seen visibly as peer mediators so people can call us, can reach us. That's one example to do it. But there are many ways to do it. And you will have to ask them how, how they want to do it. That's the key and not impose a, a structure. The structure will be found by them. It will be different in every community. And then it's important to have check-ins and to have a mentoring and ask them, hey, how is it going? What type of cases did you mediate? Where do you need help? And to have follow-up workshops that are more intensive, that is also important. And to facilitate conversations um, about the structure between, for example, the management, the community members, the social workers. That is important that you follow up and that you are still there. But at the same time, it's about agency. It's about self uh, self um Efficacy and and uh, and getting them to do it themselves instead of holding hand. That is important. They are the ones designing the structure. They are the ones designing the process, and we are there to help them if they have questions. I said last question, but I see a couple more hands. So even though I'll uh, I'm supposed to start mediating here shortly, this is important. So let me take another question or two. Uh, shall I ask them? Please. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this link was actually sent to one of the local groups for the translators. And I was wondering if, uh, if some of us can still join the course because some of us still would like to, would like to help people, but we sadly do not have information. Will it be possible for you to send a bit more information about the course, maybe in the comments? It would be really nice. Thank what, you. Bruce, why don't I respond to that? Okay. Um, this is Susan. I have my camera off. But yes, um, I would ask that you send a message, either WhatsApp or a um, Telegram message to um, either Galena or Luisa or Svetlana. And um, then we will communicate and we will get you on the list. There's a form I would ask that you set, you fill out and then we, that will start the process. Um, so, and I will also say before I turn this back over to Bruce and Helen, if there's any questions afterwards that we don't get to, please submit them in writing and I will make sure that we have an answer. You guys um, have an opportunity to read something. We'll send it out when we send everything else out. Okay. Thank you so Thank you. much. All right. One more question, please. Maybe not. Aksinia. Uh, Aksinia. Uh, 
Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I have the following question. If we speak of uh, mediation and dispute resolution and uh, uh, the context uh, is the, um, uh, the refugee shelter, shelters, what is uh, then uh, the criteria uh, which uh, allows us uh, to assess uh, a, 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 a dispute as resolved? So what are the criteria? How, how do we know that a dispute is resolved or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, with a Western mindset, we would think we would have an agreement and it's written writing and parties will stick to it. Um, you will not expect uh, everybody to come up with a detailed written agreement. And that is also not the goal. The goal is, again, to think about what makes people stick to their word. And sometimes it's a ritual. Sometimes uh, we had, for example, two parties from Angola who were questioning the mediator and who, who said, you know, we don't want to place the responsibility on the mediator that we are actually sticking to our agreement. We want to instead um, swear by the Bible. So they took a Bible, they swore by the Bible and because we want to place the responsibility on God that we will actually stick to the agreement. So, you know, when there's some sort of resolution that, that the conflict is resolved, it does not have to be a written agreement. Thank you. Okay. Um, Helen, any sort of last words or thoughts for our audience before we conclude today? Uh, thank you, Bruce. Thank you for the invitation. It's been uh, great to, to be here. I, I wish everybody um, yeah, the best. And from my heart, really, um, to I'm glad you have interest in, in, in this work. And I think you will definitely do good work. And I hope you, you will take some something away and um, I'm happy to talk to any of you anytime about any of this. So feel free to reach out to me. I'm here for you. I'm a resource and um, I really value the opportunity. Bruce and Susan, thank you so much uh, for, for this opportunity to connect. I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Helen. And uh, one of the quotes that I have used with this audience from the beginning uh, was a Dr. Martin Luther King quote. And since we just celebrated his holiday this past week, it's uh, out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. And your work is both inspirational and your generous gift of time today represents a stone of hope for this audience. So I thank you uh, very much and look forward to uh, our own uh, continued dialogue on this important topic. And I know our audience uh, thanks you as well. So um, thank you uh, for everything and appreciate uh, everybody's uh, continued participation in our program. Until next time, thank you all very much.